So yeah, as Mark said, this is um, a slightly more in-depth talk than I usually give about migrations. My usual spiel for the last, I don't want to talk about how many years about migrations, is going in like, this is how they work, this is how you use them, please don't do things wrong. Um, this is a much deeper dive into exactly how a specific part of them works. Um, but as an introduction, as Mark said, I'm Andrew Godwin. Um, I wrote South, I wrote 1.7 Migrations, I currently work at Eventbrite and the architecture team, and I am apparently at every single Django conference. I, I have missed one, ever, um, <laughs> which I'm still bitter about because I, cu I couldn't quite afford the round ticket to PyCon Australia last year, but this year I went, so it's something. But yeah, so this is um, about migrations, and because I am an engineer and these pretty slides take a lot of time to do, we're going to a much simpler format from now on. <laughs> Uh, the last one's pretty as well, but the, the rest of them are just text. Um, so this is a deep dive. Uh, if you want an overall idea of how migrations are architected or sort of a look at sort of basic way you use them, I have talks at PyCon Australia this year and at PyCon this year about how that kind of stuff works. Um, also PyCon US this year, um, sorry, DjangoCon US this year. Um, those are all much more broader talks. Uh, this is, oh, wrong side. Um, this is a deeper dive into specific parts, but I'll give you a brief overview first to give you sort of context of what's going on here. Um, so the first plan for when I was going to move migrations into Django was I was going to have these two different parts. Django would have a schema abstraction for doing changes, like DDL it's called, to databases, and it would have the RM hooks for doing like different versions of models, different field sort of changes and that kind of stuff. And then South 2 would exist, and it would have all the UI sort of migration logic stuff, like here are some files, they have operations, these turn to these RM calls. Um, that then became, eh, well, Django should have all the stuff in it really, so let's put everything into Django and let's backport it for all the other stuff, and then it went, ah. Um, <laughs> that turns out to be really hard. Uh, for a while I had a, I, I, so South 2, there is a partially working version of it somewhere I should, I should probably just release for hilarity. Um, <laughs> it, it is an automated source port of dd.migrations with regexes that replace the imports with shim modules. Um, <laughs> It, it boots and applies migrations. I'm very proud of this. Uh, but th this is sort of the, the breakdown. So I still kept the separation of schema backend from sort of UI frontend logic, even inside Django. And so you've got these sort of the backend parts here with schema editor is your main sort of thing that does, you know, hi, I want to add a, add a model. And it knows how to, on Oracle, add a table. On SQLite, add a table. Um, you know, for example, if you say, hi, SQLite, can you change this column? Um, this knows that SQLite can't do that, so it makes a new table, copies the data across, deletes the old table, renames a new table to the old table and goes, we did it, and sort of hides from you the fact that it's doing all this horrific stuff in the background. Um, it also has a way of taking fields and turning fields into their parameters for the constructor, um, and also has some changes to, uh, there's one change to model options, which is uh, be covered later, which is the underscore meta, so you can have different worlds of models talking to each other, so like different versions of your project, basically. But those are all relatively simple compared to some other things. Uh, in the same way Ansi said, other parts of the RRM are simple. Well, those are simple. Um, what we're going to talk about today is some of the stuff on this side. In particular, I want to cover these three things, the loader and the graph, the auto detector, and the optimizer. Um, so sort of a brief rundown here. What um, Migrations is doing internally is it's making a big die graph, that's a directory graph, of all of the migrations operations in your project and resolving them into an exact order to run them in. And what the job of these two things down here is to do is to make that initial graph from what you've done. So you know, you, when you go in and change a model and say, hi, and you know, I've changed these four fields and I've added this model, um, these two things in, uh, in conjunction take that change and turn it into a set of migration files that, it, that are correctly ordered and won't break on you. And then this is the thing that loads those files and then runs them in memory. The other parts here we're not going to cover. Operations are a simple abstraction about, you know, what does add ta what does add table really mean? These are generally just wrappers that go from nice Python classes to these. Um, executor is a thing that takes what the what the graph outputs and just runs them. It's basically a while loop of what you know a for loop of like for each thing in the plan run this. If it doesn't work, blow up and show a trace back. Um, and the state is horrific. You don't want to talk. That's a whole talk by itself. Um, this is how we do sort of versioned RM stuff in Django. Um, I covered that a little bit in some other talks. Um, it's, it's crazy. Um, so this is kind of how Django sees your migrations internally. We have this directed graph of stuff. Um, we have dependencies between migrations. And this is very important. Because as a little bit of history, um, SyncDB 
obviously doesn't need dependencies because what it does is it makes all the tables, sets all the constraints, and, adds the for and it sets all the foreign keys, and it's done. And because you can't change things with SyncDB because it's a, basically a one-shot thing, it doesn't have to handle these kind of dependency stuff. Whereas migrations, because it's running per app, which is a very important thing here, overall project migrations like theme migrations back in the day didn't have this issue because they weren't, they weren't per app. But because Django is very app-based, we have this thing where, well, I make the tables for app A, then for app B, then I add the foreign keys for app B and for app A. That's fine. But of course, if you don't have dependencies, and then you, you just do this like by looping through every application, you make the app A tables, then you try and add the foreign keys first, and then it breaks because the tables aren't here yet. So you need to have, you know, this is a very simple example of what becomes a very difficult problem with like, well, we have to go through and have all these dependencies, and as, I sh as you'll see in a second, there are a lot of dependencies. Um, part of the big push to get 1.7 out was finding more and more corner cases, those things we all love. Um, in migrations, we're like, well, it turns out that this tiny, ridiculous, random Django feature actually has a dependency when it's applied, and so we had to go through and fix everything. And in fact, what you're seeing here today was not in the Django 1.7 alpha. Um, the entire de operations and auto-detected dependency system was added, I think, during beta 2. Um, <laughs> Because, so in initially it was very dumb, and then as more and more bug reports came in, I was like, this is, this, this needs actual computer science. This, we can't just, <laughs> we can't get away with doing this just in order. And so everything you see here was written, not hurriedly, and I, there was a plan for it in my head, but it was added somewhat at the last moment, um, but it works a lot better than the old thing did. So let's go through some of the basic dependencies that Django is gonna know about. So th these are things that like logically, when you see these changes, you need to know what to do. And as a background, what um, auto sector is doing initially, is, so it's kind of a three-phase thing. Um, and I, you know, I'm not show you the code, this is a mostly code-free talk, but you can look at the, there's links to the files at the end. Um, what auto sector does, it does three things. It finds out all the changes, so basically it gets a big couple of sets of, here are all the old models, here are all the new models. So the ones that are removed are set difference of old from new, the ones that added a set of new from old, then altered ones, it recurs it down to then fields, and it's the same thing with field sets. And then you end up with added removed models, added removed altered fields, um, and it compares options and things too. But it basically gives you a big load of, uh, basically a big list of mostly out of ordered but kind of ordered operations. And what we used to do is we used to go, I used to carefully order how it called things. So like delete models was before create models, and then delete fields was before add fields, and then it delete foreign keys later on. And the idea was that it, it would make the list in that first pass in the right order. But it turns out that's actually not possible. And so what we need now is we make the list and we run through and we do a dependency manager on that on, as a second pass, which reorders it into the, right, into the right format. And that dependency manager takes dependencies. For example, if you have a foreign key, you need to add the thing it points to before you add the foreign key. It's pretty simple. Um, if you don't do this, um, some databases don't care, which is, which is hilarious. Um, <laughs> but, but most, most of SQL light, but most of them do. Um, uh, and of course, you also need to, which is the, the fun thing, you need to delete the column it's pointing to after you delete the foreign key. So most dependencies have a reverse mode as well that's often trickier than the forwards mode because Django is kind of all about pushing forwards and so like, let's add things, let's make things, and migrations is kind of like that too. Um, but in, you know, you have to remove things and removal is a very tricky business, especially, um, a bigger problem with migrations is if you remove a field class, a custom one, we can't handle that right now. So there's a little more um, work to be done around this stuff. But that, you know, that's a simple reverse case. For example, if you make a model, you need to do that before you add a field to it. I know this seems obvious, but you have to have all these basic concepts in the dependency manager, otherwise, because the problem is, if you don't have the basic concepts, it will reorder all the, all the really clever ones and forget about basic things like putting fields after models. Um, so when I first wrote this, I, I did all the nice complex ones you'll see at the end of these set of slides here, um, and then it's like, ah, run, and it's like, that's weird, it's trying to make models after it's made the fields to them, and it's trying to delete them before it's made them, and other, other crazy things like that. Um, it just, it got a bit crazy. So, again, of course, you need to delete the model after you change a field on it. And there's one other thing that kept, like, you know, if you had all these other things, it was like, okay, we'll just move the delete over here, and then the, the auto fields were just after the delete was going, I, we, we can't do this, what's going on? Um, so that's kind of the basic stuff. There's a lot of basic dependencies in there. I'm not gonna bore you with all of the basic ones. That would be ridiculous. However, tricky ones are fun. So, tricky dependencies. These are all the things, and quite a few of these bugs are things Andrew forgot Django had as features, because Andrew hasn't used them in three years. Um, 
there's turns out to be a lot of weird edge cases in the Django ORM, especially in the meta class, in the options class. <laughs> um, for things that I probably learned when I started doing Django back in 2006, um, and have been in there since, since around that time, but I've never seen since. And somebody puts them and goes, hi, I'm using this feature. I'm like, <laughs> okay, we should probably implement that then. Um, so, uh, I mean, the, the easy one here is um, through models for many, many fields have to be made before the many-to-many -many field. This also seems somewhat obvious, but while many-to-many -many fields themselves, um, the foreign key dependency kind of stuff kind of handles that, because inside Django, um, as Andy said, many-to-many -many models actually many, many fields actually make a mysterious middle model. Um, even for normal fields that you don't do a through model on, they make one in memory, they set auto-created to true on it, and they just have, it just has two foreign keys and an ID, basically. Um, but if you specify a through model, we have to go, oh, we need to make that separately, because if you do, it, if you do an implicit through model, you don't specify one, then add, add field makes one for you. If you have an explicit one, you need to push that before. And so that's one of the things we had to do, and of course, other way around for deletion, you could delete the through model after you delete the field. Um, if you have multi-table inheritance, who here has a multi-table inheritance application? Hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure what to think of you. <laughs> um, so multi-table inheritance can be useful, but it's very tricky from a, from a migrations perspective. So as a sort of bit of background, um, when Django serializes the models in migrations, it squashes down any abstract models and it just includes the fields in the result. It doesn't actually refer to them in the, in the basis class. For any non-models and any multi-table multi inheritance parents get put into the basis explicitly, and so we have to resolve them at runtime. Um, this means not only do we need to have them made before the child, they need to actually even exist in the sort of models cache before the child is made. And so this isn't just a problem with databases. Like as we're building the state for each version of your migrations, we have to make sure that if you're trying to build a model with a, with a parent, that parent already exists before you try and build the child. Um, what this actually turns out to be is that A, making sure that the migration that makes the parent happens before, because in the new migrations, the thing that makes the individual versions is just run through, it, you just run through the migrations in memory. And so as long as you've got that migration there before, then when we get to this migration, we'll have an, we'll an in-memory copy of the model of the parent. And then also we have a big, giant try accept catch loop um, in the state thing where we go, okay, try and render all the models. If any of them fail, put them back on the list, go through them again, and we just keep trying and trying. Um, it's very scientific. <laughs> Um, but of course, there, there is a thing where if, it, if, the, if the list does not change size, I think after two or three iterations, it does, it does then bail, it doesn't loop forever, um, which is a very useful check you should put into these kind of things. Uh, but that's one of the sort of tricky parts of doing that stuff. Um, unique together and in it together. These need to be put after the fields are made, because crazily, databases don't like it if you say, make these fields that don't exist unique together. Um, this is one of these sort of changes that happened midway through 1.7 as well, because what happened was unique and in it together used to be sort of these nice, happy operations all by themselves, where we'd make all the fields and be like, okay, we've done fields, we've done models, spit out a few unique together migrations and we're done. Um, that turns out not to work because if, and so it used to be that if you did it, if you added fields and added unique together, it was fine. But if you removed fields, added new ones, and then changed unique together, it blew up because it wasn't, let's see, it was removing the old fields before it was changing unique together. So it's blowing up because you, can't, you had to basically add the, add the new fields, change unique, then remove the old fields in that order. Um, so you, this starts to get kind of complex. Um, now, who here uses order with respect to? Yes. <laughs> you don't count. <laughs> You have, do you use it, do you use it currently? Uh, I think I've got one project that's still got it not around yet. Okay, well, okay. I, as much as I'd like to kill this feature, it exists. Um, <laughs> as someone reminded me, I think possibly in second or third beta in the ticket, I was like, wait, that exists, oh damn. Um, more importantly, order with respect to, for those who aren't familiar with it, um, it makes a extra field on the model, of course, um, <laughs> which has an implicit ordering on a foreign key. Um, so more importantly, this has so this, which is an, which is a change to something in the model meta options, actually has to turn into an add field, which actually has to run after its other field has been added, and so it, it, I think this this may have been the breaking point where I went, 
screw it, we're rewriting the auto detector. I can't do this manually with ordering. Um, but yeah, this is one of the, like, there's a few other features like this. That just, they're kind of esoteric, but enough people use them, you have to, I mean, yeah, Django has, we have to support everything. Um, part of the problem with migrations building was that there's all this history of SyncDB and a lot of assumptions. I, I broke quite a lot of assumptions already. I didn't want to break any more because if I kept going down that path, I would end up with probably a very nice migrations framework that really wasn't Django. Um, so that wouldn't have been amazing. Um, ah, this is fun. So after this happens, the next bug comes in and says, so I'm using proxy models. And I go, because <laughs> <laughs> um, so initially migrations ignored proxy models because like, you know, the theory is proxy models, they don't actually have database tables. So why do we need them in migrations? It turns out if you have them as parents of your models, you need them if you inherit from them. And so I think this bug, the person had a, t they had a model, then they had a proxy model of that model, then they had multi-table multi inheritance from the proxy model down to a child. Um, this is perfectly valid, so I have to support it, right? Um, as much as I want to go, won't fix, won't fix. I'm like, no, I'm a professional, we're gonna do this. Um, so I changed the way we do, so before this, of course, proxy models were ignored. Um, I had to go through, change it so proxy was respected by the entire migration system to actually render proxy models. Um, and then change the auto detector so that it actually looks for proxy models and then it has a separate pair of sets for existing proxy models and does its own separate creations for each of those. But the fun thing is, what happens if you change a proxy model and you take out proxy equals true? So it's a one line change for the developer. <laughs> and you go, that's obvious, right? You know, what, think about it, what should actually happen when you do that? It's not really well defined, is it? Um, so, to, to migrations, what you're actually doing is you're deleting an entire proxy model and you're making an entire new model. And more importantly, you have to delete the model of the same name before you create the model of the same name. Um, <laughs> otherwise, hilarity happens and the entire RM breaks. So this was fun for a while. Um, <sighs> yeah, proxy models. Uh, there was another feature as well where we were just ignoring stuff completely. I forget what it is now. Um, but it turns out if you think early in development you can ignore stuff completely, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> So you're optimistic, I think, is more the word. Overly optimistic. So, ah, here's my favorite one, impossible dependencies. Um, yes. <laughs> so, in a, in a possibly misguided um, attempt to fix the author's problem, and actually, I, they, were quite a, they were quite a good fix um, at the time. Um, <laughs> Hello. <laughs> no. So swapping models are quite a nice solution to the problem where Django expects to go to auth user. However, what they actually do internally in Django is that there is a registry. Well, it's not even a registry. That makes things easier. Um, swapping models at load time just set a value on the options class of the model you're replacing. Say, huh, no, I'm swapped out for this one, and it's a pointer basically to the other model. And what happens then is whenever Django tries to hit the model, it goes huh, and then dives down to the pointer and gets the real one. That's fine. However, and more importantly, that's fine if you set this at the start of your project. But what happens if you make some migrations, all the foreign keys point to auth user, and then you change the value of the setting immediately? Well, let's say you're in the happy world, you're using the frankly amazing built in Django auth app. <laughs> Why anyone would replace it, I have no idea. Um, more importantly, we, we, we're, actually, I think we're actually fixing the email length bug in 1.8 with a ship migration, finally. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's not entirely unfit for purpose now. Um, so, you know, you've got this, you've built this, okay, as most people do, you realize, oh, oh no, I need to actually change this. But you've already got these migrations. So, you change the setting, and you change it to point to, let's say, a thing called third app. What actually happens is this. And then all hell breaks loose. <laughs> and then. Right. <laughs> ah, I love visual gags. Um, so the problem is what's happening here is that you have changed the dependency tree and Django has no idea you've done this. Like the, fir like the first time, like one time you run a command, it's like this. The next time, without warning, it's suddenly like this. It hasn't, and it does, Django doesn't know it used to be like this. It has no, Django does not preserve state enough to know that you've changed this. And so, as far as Django is concerned, you applied all of these ones, you haven't applied this, which is basically impossible because you can't apply this without this one, and things just start blowing up. 
And more importantly, your tables here have foreign keys to auth, not to third app. So you, you can't roll this back. The only way to solve this is to, is, to, is to roll back all the way down to here, apply this, and then roll up all the other things again. And that, that's going to delete data. Um, so the current, so the fix for this bug was to write, in the documentation, don't do this. Um, and, and basically, if you change that setting beyond the, the first couple of migrations, it's your responsibility to, to change this stuff. And the best response to this is, this isn't a regression, because that's how it used to be. Um, SyncDB didn't do this for you. Neither does migrations. <laughs> um, I, I, I would love to find a way to fix swappable models. And, and the bigger problem is we have a, f so this kind of works. So the, way, the reason this dependency even switches in is because um, the dependencies list in the migration file, so by default, it's a list of strings. Um, if you've got a foreign key to auth model, auth user model, it actually we put a function in there called swappable key and point to the model, and that resolves at import time to whatever your setting is set to. And so that's the reason it even works at all. Um, so this is, you know, if you're a third-party app, you can at least ship things, because like, if you haven't applied these, it's fine. So third-party apps can ship migrations, dependent auth user, that works perfectly. As a running project, you can't switch midstream. That's, that's the main restriction. Let's go past this. Um, that's what I just said. I forgot that slide was there. OK, how is it implemented? Um, as I said before, the old answer was very careful function ordering. Um, that is not very, so that's how South does it incidentally as well. South is just a very carefully selected set of things and a few tweaks midway. So like I think South tweaks to put a few alters in different places, but mostly it just assumes ordering. But more importantly, South did not do dependencies. If you used South and made migrations, your migrations had no, like dependency support was in South, but it was not done by the auto detector. And so it was your job to put dependencies in for foreign keys. And of course, most people forgot. And even if they remember, they didn't, like, you know, we're only human. We're going to do things wrong occasionally. And so we had all these wonderful bugs with South. People were like, well, it's trying to apply this foreign key for tables. It's like, you need to write a dependency there, like the docs. People don't read docs. As, as an open source developer, you learn that people, like, a wonderful set of people, I'm sure you're all in this category, read all the documentation <laughs> extensively. Which is why you want to use what lookup was. Exactly. Um, Unfortunately, even I, I'm very guilty of this, people skim read documentation or they miss the important parts. And so a big part of how I was doing the migrations in Django was like, this needs to be much more bulletproof than South. South lets you, lets you shoot yourself in the foot very easily. It's like, well, you know, here is a wonderful set of operations that can delete everything you've ever loved in your database. Have fun. Um, <laughs> I think a, a fortuitously, a very small number of people have, have wiped the database with South. I'm very proud of this. It's somewhat safe. Um, but Django, Django is safer. So the basic thing that goes on here is that what happens is we have, as I said before, this big list of operations. The, the functions in AutoDetector, there's a big list of them. They just run in order. They output a big list. And then that's phase one. Phase two, we step through the list. So we stop with, for every, every item, we start with a pointer to it, and then we go over everything after it. And we go, OK, does this depend on this? No. Does these two depend on it? Ah, these two depend on each other. Um, and in fact, the resolver only supports depending on something being before you, because it turns out if you, d you don't need both ways, you can just reverse the, the way around. So all it does is you specify a big list when you add an operation to say, hi, here is an operation to add a field. It should run it should run after any create model of that field. It should run after any delete of the same field name, you know, and that kind of stuff. And then a delete field says, hi, I should run after and, and specifies things as well. So if we see a dependency match. All we do is we rip it out of there, pop it in after the one it matched, and then list returns and we start again. And that, that, that keeps looping over and over again until we go through the entire list and no changes. We go, OK, we're done. We drop through to phase three. So you know, it's not too complicated. There is almost certainly a much better way of doing this. Um, my professors in university are probably looking at this going, <laughs> this is not computer science. This is, this is basic. But it, it works well enough. Um, I'd love to improve this a little bit, but dependency resolution is, is tricky. Um, the more fun part of this is phase three is we take this big list of operations. Now, at this point, all the apps and all the different operations for everything else are mixed up. So we might have make app A model, make app B model, add, operation, add foreign key to app A, add foreign key to app B, all in one list. We have to take these lists, this one big list, and turn it into separate streams of individual migrations chopped at the boundaries where dependencies happen, which is tricky than it sounds. 
Um, so in particular, you have to make sure that migration, because you know, the trivial way of doing this is having one migration per operation and going, well, we have all the dependencies, this is trivial, you end up with a thousand migrations the first time you run it, that's not great. So instead what we do is we go through and we sort of keep going up a list, keep sort of drawing this until we find a dependency. And we go, okay. And then we sort of go to all the next, you go through all the apps on the list and sort of you try and grow different pieces of each app to work out which bits you can safely do without having a dependency clash. Then you chop them all off, it's actually called chop, I believe, in the code, um, into migrations, then you, then you go up the list again. And often what this means is sort of you just keep doing one, then you move it, then suddenly you can, at that point you can then resolve the next one along. It sort of, it flits around between them until it eventually ends up with all the things at the bottom. They're all, on, they're all in migrations, it's happy, it drops to writing them out of disk. Um, occasionally, it can't resolve these. Um, there are a couple of valid cases where I have seen operations that should be resolvable, they aren't. Um, we've caught nearly all of them in tests though. So if you find one, I think, I think the exception even says, hello, you found this bug, please bug report it to, this, to, to the bug tracker, this shouldn't happen. Um, because there's a couple of things in the dependency resolver that like, I know this should be perfect, we haven't quite got to resolving them yet, but we'll get there. Optimization. Now, the dumb thing is when we make the big list, we make the big list very verbosely. So for, when, for example, when we make a model, the create model part of auto detector, all it does is it goes, okay, I've got a model. For all the normal fields, that's non-relational fields, it makes one create model operation. And then for every single foreign key, doesn't care what it's doing, every single many to many, it makes a separate operation. Even if it's the only model in the project and you could do it all in one big, ad, one, one big create model, because you know, that's the sensible way of doing this stuff. Um, in fact, it used to be the case it did that, and then the rewrite changed it. And so now, it's very, very verbose. Every tiny change, every small thing is split out so we can do dependencies properly. And once we've resolved the dependencies, we then re-optimize it. So op what optimizing does is it has even more rules, there's even more in here than there are in the auto detector. And it takes that big list of operations and it tries to consolidate individual pairs of them into one operation. For example, colors. If you have a create model and delete model of the same model, that's actually nothing. We can just delete both of them and it's the same result. If you have a create model and a create field, say a foreign key like I previously mentioned, that can turn in a create into a create model. And similarly, create field and auto field is just a create, and you, you can collapse all of these. And again, this is one way. So this is always defined as, can I collapse the right-hand side into the left-hand side? Um, or in some cases, can I collapse both of them into nothing? And so what this is, there's a big set of rules in a file I'll link to at the end. Um, and each rule returns either two new operations, one operation, or none. And what it's saying is, I I've, I've rewritten these two into two new ones. I've collapsed them into one operation, so replace, replace the first one with that new one and delete the second one. Or I have decided these two are completely useless by themselves, discard both of them away. And all the rules go through. And again, um, this works on a sort of a, a list basis. And so we go through all the different things and we go, okay, these two things have a rule that says they can reduce. And we've run the rule, and the rule says, yes, I can reduce these two to one, one um, operation. However, so the first version of this only ever did pairs. It did things that are right next to each other. It went, okay, for everything in the list, look at its immediate sibling and go, can I reduce this? That's not very clever. Because what happens is you get add model A, add model B, add foreign key to model A, add foreign key to model B. That's technically optimizable, but this, is, but this was too dumb to do that. So instead what it does now is it goes, okay, I've got these pairs. Is anything in the middle going to conf conflict with that? So in particular, for the foreign key case, does the model I reference, does anything happen to the model I reference between me and the thing I'm collapsing with? It's a very simple check. It's, it's a very pessimistic check. The check is designed to fail, it's, it's, under, it's done to fail um, if it doesn't know. So it's a, it, false, false positives, basically. Because um, you know, it's better to not optimize than to optimize wrongly, is, is the idea behind the optimizer. And if it is you know, non-conflicting, we can reduce it down to one thing. That's perfectly fine. If it is conflicting, though, we keep going. And actually what happens is, as you sort of cycle through this, again, it cycles and cycles, so it doesn't change size, uh, or just, no, until nothing happens, sorry, because it can swap things around. Um, as you cycle through this, often things you couldn't do before have been collapsed themselves and now they're possible. And so you just keep going and going round the optimizer until eventually you get to a stable state. Um, I, if I was academic, I would prove it reached a stable state. I cannot prove that. 
Um, I'm reasonably sure it does. Uh, there is a limit in there of, I think, there's, I think if you hit a million iterations, it goes, huh, and just quits. Um, so if, if one of you has like a million models, come talk to me. We need to change the number. But apart from that, it's probably fine. I, it seems big enough. Uh, yeah, so the key thing is this is applied after, so it's basically between phases, um, I think between phase one and two this is applied. So you get, you know, so up two and three. So after the R dependencies, you then apply it to all detection. Also, applied after squash. So squash is the thing where you can take a whole load of in, like migrations from apps. So say, you know, this definitely hasn't happened ever. You are a big CMS. Um, it has Django in the name, and you have like a hundred migrations, and you just squash them all down to one, and South doesn't support this, and it doesn't really work very well. Sorry about that. Um, so the problem is, like, you, as you grow, and as you become more and more of an established project, like, you know, this wasn't a problem in South's first year, because no one was using it for long enough. In South's third year, all these projects had like 150 migrations, and running through all of them initially takes a long time. Like, we were talking like 20 minutes and, and hours for some people. And so the old solution was to take all the migrations, delete them all, make new initial ones, and then fiddle with the tables in South, say, no, no, it's totally, you've only got one, you've applied it, definitely, it's 100% true. <laughs> um, and South was like, yeah, definitely, that's fine, yeah. yeah it's, a good, it's a good little program. Um, the, the problem with that one is that's fine, but every time, when you do that and you commit the new files, you have to run that fake um, database change on every single machine the new files go on to. If you are a third-party app, that is a massive pain to do because you have to tell your users, hi, in the release notes, can you, and they just to say, like, can you run these commands arbitrarily? They'll fix stuff, we promise. Um, even if you're like a big sort of website, like, you know, Eventbrite has several hundred servers, running this in parallel on the servers, like, what if one fails? Like, how, you know, it's a lot of management overhead. The new solution is Squash. Squash basically has this thing where you have um, a whole set of migration files and you can take all of them and squash them into one new migration that says what it replaces. And these can coexist in the same directory. And so what actually happens is the migration class, so each file is a migration class, there's a thing called replaces and it's a list of names of migrations. And as you'll see in a second on the, the graph stuff, um, when Django loads up, it goes, ah, we have all these old ones, we have a new one that claims to replace them, so we're just going to load the new one instead and run through that. And if we just, you know, how this does is done in simplicity is you take all the old migrations, you get all the operations lists, you append them to each other, and you write a new file out. Sounds great. Um, it's a very long file that happens, though, because you've got, you know, a year of history of all these changes that have happened. Like, you know, you've added 100 fields, you've got 100 add fields. So between the appending and the writing out, we actually run the optimizer over it as well. So when you squash, you actually have like all of your ad fields are squashed up as much as they can into, into a new crate model and stuff like that. So it's a lot smaller than it necessarily had to be before. The final part here is loading and the graph. So you know, once you've written all these files to disk, it's great. Um, we have to load them into memory. And we have to load them into an actual graph data structure. So Django now has a graph data structure that has things like get me the leaf nodes, get me the root nodes, and all sort of basic things for a um, kind of digraphy tree thing. It's got a technical name, I'm sure. I'm not very good at technical names. And so when we load these from disk, first of, all, first of all, we scan the disk. We scan all the modules of all the apps. We look in migration module settings. Like if you've changed the module that migrations live in, look there instead. We load everything with a .py extension. Um, as Vincent talked about .py, .py C stuff as well. That's still sort of up in the air a little bit. Um, and then we import all of those into memory. We nab the class out of them called migration. And then that class becomes the node in the graph. And migration classes inherit from, all, from a common base class in Django called migration. They have basic functions and basic methods and parameters. Um, sort of, you know, by default, operations is empty list, in case you didn't want them. You know, replaces is empty list. Dependencies is empty list. And then we have this big sort of flat set of migrations. And we go through and we look at all the dependencies and we link all the dependencies up. So we, we sort of traverse through the entire list and then tell the graph, OK, there's an edge from here to here. There's an edge from here to here. We just go through all of them and put all the edges into the graph. We end up with a proper graph where we can go, OK, get me this node. You know, find me all the parents of it and that kind of stuff. 
Secondly, we then look in the database. And in the database is a table called Django migrations. And that is the same as the old South migration table. It says, it's basically a list of this migration was applied or not applied. And sort of that's all it is. It's a big list of yes, no. And it's a state of what has been done. So we load all that and we mark every migration class with this has been applied, this hasn't been applied, this has been applied, this hasn't been applied. And so at the end of the day, you've got this big graph which represents both the state of what things are, like the possibilities of what could happen and also how far you've actually got. So you can see here that we're starting to get to the point where you know, we have all these options and we have sort of how far we've got. Then we go through and go, okay, we have this other set of migrations over here. So on the first disk load, if you've got replaces, we throw you into a separate bucket and go, later, we'll deal with you later. And we come back in the third phase and we go, okay, these replaces migrations claim to replace migrations one through five. So we go and check, are all of those migrations applied or unapplied? It doesn't matter if which one they are, as long as they're all the same. If they're all the same, we can remove them and put the new one in its place with the same state they all had. If they are different, we can't do that. For example, if you um, say you have migrations one to 10 and you've made one that, that squashes one to 10, so you've got one, a brand new one called one squash. You know, I, as a developer, have obviously applied all 10 migrations, and so I can just run the squashed one. As, you know, say, say one of my end users, they've only got to five, they're, 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 they're lacking behind, they've only got to five, and so they're on five, they download the new commit or the new release, and you know, if we just ran the squash one, like we can't, like we're, we're in the middle of that squash migration, we can't actually traverse that. So instead, um, Django knows this traverse instead, to traverse the remaining five, and then it's like, okay, now that all apply, we can remove them and put one squash one in its place. And that's kind of all done as part of the graph stuff, basically. The, the graph, um, its main job is to return plans. So what this is, is you, so when you call migrate, um, either you specify an app or you specify nothing, what you're really saying is, I want to migrate to these nodes. And when you say app, Django interprets that as the leaf node of that app, so it finds the one that's got no children and picks that one. If you say nothing, it says, it, Django presumes, I want the leaf nodes of every app and just finds every single leaf node of every app and goes, those are the ones. Um, and then it works out all the ancestors of those in dependency order. So you know, a way you can apply them such that you've always got the parents in, in place. It's a depth first search, it's not very complicated. Um, it is, however, very expensive at the, at the moment. Um, this is not only used for running migrations, this is used for the state stuff. So state, separate thing, but what state does is you run through every migration operation in memory, and then you end up with a virtual model of that point in history. And so if you want to have a state, you can tell graph, give me the state of node X, and just it works out the plan, and just runs through it in memory, and gives you the result back. So it can give you, at any point in any part of this graph, what that moment in history was like. So you can actually, there's a fun demo I have, I, ha I should probably release, where you can run Django without models py, py files and just in migrations, um, because you can make it run off the ORM from the old migrations, which is, <laughs> um, I don't recommend this, because you lose all your managers, you lose all your custom <laughs> methods, um, but it's, it's possible. Like, it's a fully fledged ORM, it has all the same stuff in it. Some laughter over there. D <laughs> Descent in the ranks. <laughs> No, oh, that's true. It's good. Rest. <laughs> it's still better. Oh. <laughs> okay. However, so there, there is some room for improvement. Um, this is kind of my call to you because apparently everyone here is coming to the sprints tomorrow. So, you know, I, not, so this half we do migrations. That'd be great. Um, <laughs> so the key problem here is there's two main performance problems that came out 1.7. Now they weren't fixed at release because the main thing was to actually release 1.7 because we were like four months late. Um, but the auto detector and it was some guy. <laughs> yeah, he he he's a bit terrible. I don't want to talk about him. Um, the release manager. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so the key problem here: auto detector is slow. Optimizers are not great. These are both quite true. So in particular, the auto detector kind of gets a bit crunched up on very large projects and changes because it's doing a lot of busy work, all of those loops, and you know, it's, quite, it's quite dumb. It's very simple code. It's actually quite easy to read, ish. There's a lot of nesting loops, um, but it is quite dumb. It doesn't do a lot of memorization or dynamic, dynamic programming, all the stuff that I was taught when I was actually learning this stuff. Um, and the optimizer similarly um, sort of just 
flits around everywhere, just keeps running loops and loops again. And actually, the optimizer could probably just keep going. It, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't have to reset every time, basically. Um, the worst thing, arguably, is, is this graph state building. Now, if you have, I think the person who reported this bug has on the order of 400 models and like, 100 app, like 10 or 100 apps, something like that, a large number of models, basically. Um, the complexity is such that it's very, it, it, the runtime complexity is so bad that it just starts becoming like 30 seconds to even run a basic migrate or make migrations. And so there's a lot of room in there to take what's currently there and make it actually sensibly fast. Um, in particular, whenever it's building, so Django is building a state for every single end of an operation. It's building one for the start and end of every operation to pass into the underlying class. It's not reusing states for those. It's rebuilding them every time. And building a state is fast. It's, a, it's appreciably quick. When you're doing it 100,000 times, it's not appreciably quick in, in, in overall. And so there's a lot of work there to basically cache the intermediate states and sort of build on each other. Um, there's a few bugs there where the states are meant to be basically immutable, where you, if you make a new one, you make a new version of it with a new state. That's not quite true because some of the classes and fields keep references to each other. So they kind of, if you change a field, it changes the one four versions ago and stuff. There's a few fun bugs with that. They're mostly squashed, but there's a bit more work there. So if you are looking to work on migrations, I would love if you come talk to me about the stuff. Um, there are some very easy bugs to solve as well, some very hard ones like this. Um, the code is, I think, beautiful. <laughs> Um, it's, it's certainly a lot easier to read than some, some of the old code in Django. It's, you know, it has spaces and some comments. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like, I, you know, honestly, talk to me. There's plenty of other people as well who are helping out. Um, there's been some fast, fantastic help from people who aren't me. Uh, people claim I wrote migrations. I kind of did the first bit of the work. A lot of the hard work was done by other people. Um, a lot of the bug reporting as well. So it's not, you know, but you can definitely help out here. Um, if you're interested in reading these, which they're fascinating, honestly, like bedtime reading this stuff, <laughs> um, auto detector is in, surprisingly, migrations auto.py. Um, I suggest you start to detect changes and follow the call. There's, these slides are on, online, by the way, afterwards, so you can, I'll link them at the end. Um, detect changes is kind of the entry point, like it's got a big, that's where you've got a big list of function calls, then you've got phase two and phase three all in line with that function, just follow that through. Um, the optimizer lives in optimizer.py, you know, sensible names. Um, here you want to look at the reduce function. That's basically, we call reduce again and again and again. That sort of says these two things, check the rules, check the conflicts, do it. And there's a loop above that that sort of loops around. That's the key logic here. And then the graph is much simpler. Um, graph.py is just that data model I talked about. It's not got much logic in it, apart from sort of the planning stuff. And then loader here is things that's like squashing, replacing, and that's where you can see like how Django loads things in the memory. Um, Thank you. I think we'll sort of questions as well. So. so he's got a question. Anyway, he's got a question. Having gone through this two weeks ago, I think you can not too badly change your um, swappable model uh, by using um, separate uh, state and database. Separate, separate database and state, yeah. OK. Um, so maybe so that's worth explaining because you, you say that the people are on their own, but they may need it, and so some projects could be helpful. <laughs> yeah, so, so, um, so there's a couple of operations in migrations that the, the auto detector never does. Um, so one of them, so that there's run SQL and run Python. They run SQL and Python, relatively obviously. And there's the hilarious separate database and state, which what it does is it's a migration. It's an operation you give two other oper you'd give two lists of operations to. The first list is what to run on the database. The second list is what to run in memory for the state change, because the, the, the idea is that you're doing something different. So in Amory's case, you could do the foreign key changes in the database half and do nothing in the state half, and that would fix the problem. Um, but it's still, it's still a general issue, but yeah, that, that, that's one, one way of doing it. Other questions? So back in the early ages of South, there were data migrations. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about why there aren't data migrations? So the reason, so in the, in the very early days of South, they were not separate. They were the same class. And then I think in South 0.6, um, there was a new base class for data versus schema migrations. The reasoning being that data migrations wanted to be run in a transaction. Schema migrations did not want to be run in a transaction for MySQL purposes. Um, because of the way we've, re we've, we've, we've changed to operations now, they're their own atomic components. So now data migrations are run Python or run SQL if you're very simplistic. Um, run Python itself is run in transaction, but the rest of the stuff isn't. So like because data migrations are now this separate block of stuff, 
And because of like, you know, it's a much better like declarative way of doing migrations rather than like just function calls. Like, we know this bit is data, we know this bit is schema. And so it, it, we can have more intelligence about it. So um, you would use run Python for data migration? Yeah, run, run Python data migrations now, exactly. There, there's, a, there's a guy, I think it has this, run Python has the exact same call syntax as South Forwards does. So you just use it the same. Like, I think the only difference is instead of an RM object, you get an apps object. So you do get model rather than square braces. It's the same apart from that. So. Torres. I'm interested in knowing what happens if you remove, after squashing migrations to one yes. file, what happens if you delete the old stuff because you ah. don't want to keep that around? Excellent question. Um, so if it can't find the old ones, it just Django ignores them. Because the, 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 the flow is you do the squash run, you, sh you ship both. Next release, you remove the old ones and ship the, the change. Um, if you can't find them, Django's like, yeah, they've probably been deleted, it's fine. Um, you should probably, so you, what you should do is you should ship both then ship just a new one, and then the third release should be you remove the replaces stanza in the migration file. So Django just sees it as a normal migration at that point. Um, I suspect as we go through more than two or three months of 1.7, we'll see some bugs in that stuff, because I don't think anyone's done a big squash yet, but we'll fix them as we get to them, hopefully, and it will become much more reliable. So, so if you're using this, your recommendation to your users should definitely be, if you're doing updates, do an update, run migrate do an update, run my great one version at a time, yeah. rather than it's, jumping it's, up four versions so it's, of an external like, app at once. It's like upgrading Django versions, right? When you, do, when, you do upgrade, up, when you upgrade Django, you want to go ver small version by small version each time. Same with migrations, right? I mean, there is a way of doing it otherwise. You can, you can leave them there forever if you want to. You can leave, if you leave replaces in there forever, it'll just work. Um, but my recommendation is to do sort of these small incre incremental changes over time, which is better than nothing. You know. More uh, questions? Oh, shy. Oh. So um, squashing and data migrations don't really work together, right? Because if you, like, if you squash something, oh wait, if you just replace it uh, after a while, you you still have to do the whole upgrade path from version to version. You can't do uh, well. So so this this is an interesting combination. So the reason, so if it wasn't for the optimizer, they would work perfectly because you end up with the same. You know, it's the same operations just in one migration, and the optimizer it sees run Python as an opaque box. It will not optimize through run Python or run SQL for that matter. Um, it just always, they, both of those operations always, always return eye conflict with everything. So if you have data migrations, you can squash, it won't be as efficient as a, as a better squash. And you can go in and manually change things around if you want to as well. Um, but just yeah, be aware that Optimizer currently goes, huh, and treats them as a bad box. We, we could potentially try and do code introspection, I wouldn't want to probably, um, just leave them as they are, but yeah. Any more? Oh, check. Oops. Um, can you have parallel squashes? I mean, um, suppose you have migrations one to ten. Can you have squashes at the same time, both for one to five and for say three to seven and so forth? I think the answer is yes. Um, is it a good idea? No. <laughs> so um, I th so I think the problem there I, I think that is probably a bug because. When it applies squashes, it will, I think what will happen is the first one that it finds that fits, it will take, and it won't take the other one. So it's probably, it's probably non-deterministic in terms of which one it picks. Um, you could, I mean, they can live there safely, but you may not get the desired effect, is what I'm saying. You know, it's not gonna break, it's not gonna do the, the right thing. Do you see any chance to make swappable models public API? <laughs> um, the one thing we need is a registry. So currently, swappable model, there's no way of telling what models are swappable and which ones are swapped out in Django. Um, so a lot of the code in migrations that does swap up is, is tied to auth user because we know what the setting for auth user is. Um, the way you define swappable models is that you just set this thing on a options and it just sort of does its own thing. There's no way of telling overall which of my 100 models are swappable and which ones should I resolve. And so if we had that, possibly, um, but we had a lot of caveats of like swappable models don't work quite like you expect. And I'd like to support them for like, there are apps that really need them as well, I think, but we need a little bit more work to get them perfect. Um, a, a large part of the problem is at the level of the app registry. Uh, and if uh, we can uh, simplify things there, and we can do that in 1.9 because lots of things that are merely deprecated in 1.7 and 1.8 will be outright forbidden in 1.9 and everyone will have to fix their imports. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
and well, this, this is debatable because uh, attempting to control the import sequence is complicated, but well, we haven't found a better solution yet. Uh, and so when we get there, uh, it may be may easier uh, to do stuff so we can track that better in the app registry and figure it out when Django starts, loads model, et cetera. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, even things like, if we can solve that one problem, it's fine, but solving the problem itself is, is an issue. So yeah, I, I'm hopeful we can, we can do it. Uh, um, is there any plan to make a squashing not from the first migration, but Another one. Uh, so technically, it's possible right now. It's just that the the command is hard coded to start at, at zero 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 one. Um, you could probably just edit the command and change it at starts, and it would work. Um, there's there's nothing in the logic that prohibits squashing any other set of migrations. It's just that I saw no reason why people would want to necessarily. But yeah, I mean, I, I if you can. To, yeah. I you can, can you give you want, an example. But. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> sure, yeah. Just, as we've seen before, my assumption's not correct most of the time. Um, yeah, like, if you want to, you could even manually squash them by just copying and pasting operations into one file and putting, putting it in yourself. So, yeah. Sometimes in big projects, you end up with these uh, huge apps with like uh, 30, 40, 50 models. Uh, and you want to split them up, uh, do a big refactor. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there anything, any story in migrations to help you with that? Yeah, so I mean, that's one of the currently big open questions is can we do app model moving across apps? Yeah. Um, right now, that's not a natively supported thing in migrations. Because we do automatically support the renaming of a model. Yeah, so rename models inside an app is now supported. However, that is still heuristical. So the problem is if you rename a model, um, it looks like you've deleted one, added another one that looks exactly the same. And so South issues go, you've deleted one and made one, and did that. Um, the new stuff heuristically checks and says, it looks similar enough that I'll go with it. And it's, it, it prompts you every time, in fact. But it, that would all be heuristical. So we, like, we had to go like, well, this model's vanished. This other model and this other app has the same name and the same signature. They're probably the same. Do we want to do a rename? So like, it would have to still be heuristical and like asking questions and stuff. But there's, there's a framework for that. So we could, we could do it. But it's just not 1.7 yet. Would it be worth for something like that having hints that you can stick on the model to say, this is what I've just done? Uh, it, it could be like so. Right now, it's interactive. Um, we could change the hint system instead. And the way it actually works, there's a there's a questioner class, and the questioner class basically gets told it gets it, it gets asked, should I do this? And it respond either it asks the user or in tests it actually has pre-programmed answers. But we could change it so it looks for hints instead. Like it's a kind of abstracted thing. Like should I do this? Yes, no. Um, as a compliance to the question, I think you can rename a model across app with separate database and state again, and you just rename yeah, the database table and everything follows. Manually, it's <laughs> perfectly possible, right? It's a thing, but automatically is the question. But yeah, manually, you can, you can just, what I would say is, is you can change DB table in the old app, and then in the new app, have a create model with zero database and all in state, and it should work fine. And so other, but it's, it's tricky. And that, that's, a, that's a generic enough thing. So you can create operation subclasses in your own code. And yeah. you could, like, if that was something you were doing a lot, you can make an operation subclass as you take this and do this. I mean, that's um, weird. This that's is weird. the one side and this is the other side. Be third party. Like, you know, be a third party app that would work I, quite I'd nicely. rather be cool, but it could be done separately if you wanted in, to. Do. In 1.8, there will be at least one operation subclass which is not auto detected, which is Postgres extensions. From his stuff. Because I've written that. So. <laughs> I'm going to come over here first. Uh, is there any chance we'll be able to disable migrations in tests like we could in South to speed uh, things up? I'm afraid not. Um, so right now, as, so currently in, in 1.7, migrations and SyncDB code, the, the old code still exists. Uh, migra migrate just runs SyncDB second, or, no, first, sorry. Um, as of 2.0, that code is going away. Um, and the remaining bits will be of creation will be moved. So there's a class of creation that's the old stuff, and the new one's called schema editor. So we'll move the, f the last few pieces from creation to schema editor, and then we'll delete the old creation stuff. So unfortunately not. We could, in theory, run the auto detector and then just run its migrations directly rather than doing the whole history. Um, but some, like a lot of projects rely on data migrations for tests and stuff. So it would probably opt in, but it could be possible in the future. Um, I'm going to go Marcus. Is it possible again. to um, possible to disable migrations for test if you reform the uh, migration model settings to not yeah. existing uh, Python uh, volume? So, so right now, if you if you redirect the setting the I've the migrations it. module, but that will fail that will fail in a few releases. So yep. just just. Um, 
I think we got a keep DB option to keep the DB between tests yes. and then migration don't run. Uh, yes, that's a good point. Very good point. So that solves 99% of the problem. As long as your tests are clean and clean up after themselves, it's fine. So. Yep. So you can just keep the same actual yeah. database. Any more questions? Um, currently, we use uh, data migration sometimes just to enforce certain maintenance scripts mm -hmm. are running. Are we kind of abusing the purpose of a data migration, or a is bit. that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so my my thought is so maintenance scripts I prefer being run as written as management commands because often you want to apply them sort of outside the scope of migrations. Uh, that's more just the environment. Like you know, the opposite side of me doesn't want things magically happening. It wants to be able to run things itself. You know, um, it's probably fine. Um, just be aware that like your squashes and your tests are getting slower because of that. So like you're kind of conflating a little bit. Yeah, but it it doesn't. It's not a massive issue. Any more questions? Okay, this will be the last question then. Seems like we're nearly done. It's lunch soon. Mm. Exactly. Uh, have you heard of Django model translations? Do you know that I application? Have. Yeah. Yes. Well, how how does uh, the migration thing handle that? Because it, it creates uh, schema uh, or model uh, changes outside of the application. You re register model and then it adds fields to that model. I believe it w when I tested it, I, I, I tested it last in beta, but it did work then because because when you run make migrations, it runs after all the imports have happened. If it adds fields during import, then make migrations will see the fields and add them correctly. Um, it may not be perfect, but it does. It should work as long as you mutate the models during the setup, the setup phase of what the new uploading stuff does. It should be fine, because make migrations runs after setup. If you're mutating them at runtime, like during views, a please stop. B it won't work. <laughs> Yeah, so, so um, what will happen is the um, Django migration will see, it will think you've changed the models, because it's not reading the models files, it's reading the models in memory. So it will think you've changed the file and just write them as part of the app. So if you, every time you change the list of, translate, list of languages, it will make or delete fields, basically. Just put what we want. Yeah. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you.